Let's pray this morning. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the cross of Calvary, for the penalty of sin which was paid, that we might be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And Lord, this morning as we enter into your word, draw us, Lord, to the cross, but most of all, draw us to you. Help us to understand the imminence of your coming. Lord, that we might go about and doing the work that you've called us to do on this earth, which is simply sharing the gospel. Forgive us, Lord, where we fall short. In Jesus' name, amen. I shared a couple of weeks ago that I was going to begin a series in the book of Romans. And I apologize for not being here last Sunday. Sue and I had, uh, with everything that was going on, I needed a Sunday off. And so we took a Sunday off uh, last week. And I appreciate Brother Mike Shields for supplying for me on such short notice. And I could tell, I didn't watch the entire sermon. I could tell from the very from his introductory remarks that he was happy to be here. And, and uh, I've heard that he did a great job. We're going to pick up, I, two weeks ago, I uh, preached a message entitled, The Just Shall Live by Faith. And it was based upon Romans in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. This morning, we're going to pick up in verse 18, and we're going to go through the end of the chapter, through the 32nd verse of the first chapter of Romans. Before Paul was able to promote his message of righteousness by faith, beginning in chapter 3 all the way through chapter 8, he had to propose to mankind as to why it was important that they understand that salvation was by grace through faith alone. Paul would reiterate that to the church at Ephesus. He would encourage the church at Colossae. He would command the church at Corinth. He would encourage those who would come after him ultimately to preach the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew Henry, in his commentary, says that the apostle begins to show that all mankind need the salvation of the gospel because none could obtain the favor of God or escape his wrath by their own works. That song, These Are the Days of Elijah, how prophetic that truly is. And we look to the Word of God today for our guidance, for our encouragement, for our strength, but ultimately also for the revelation of salvation. And so as we look here, we're going to begin reading, as I said, in verse 18, several things I want to bring out. <clears throat> it says in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, if you're not opposed to the idea, I'd like for you to underline or highlight those words without excuse. The reason that I want to present this message to you this morning is so that we can truly understand the wrath that will fall upon the unrighteous. Many have pointed to the latter part of chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, as pointing to the Gentile guilt. Those who have yet to hear the gospel, and some have even said, for instance, Dr. David Jeremiah says that those who do not hear the gospel will not be judged because they reject him. But Paul writes very vividly in the first chapter that they will be judged. Not because they have not, been, have not heard the gospel, but because it has been revealed to them through the creation of an almighty God. And so what I would like to propose to you this morning, first of all, is that they have the revelation. We find that word revealed, the King James English. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. 
but it also points out that they hold the truth in unrighteousness. So we find that God's revelation of his holy and righteous wrath. Dr. John MacArthur points out that God reveals his wrath in two ways. First of all, that of being indirect. And he points out for us that that comes through natural consequences and violating ultimately his universal moral law. And we're going to continue reading here in just a moment. And we're going to point out in God's word regarding that moral law. John MacArthur also points out it comes also directly through God's personal intervention. Through God's personal intervention. God's wrath is going to ultimately pour out from heaven. We find, if you continue reading Dr. MacArthur's study, wrote, study notes, he speaks the various kinds of God's wrath. Now, I didn't base this message solely upon John MacArthur, but I want to point out some things that he points out for us in his notes. First of all, there is that of eternal wrath. That of eternal wrath. That is the judgment of hell. That those who ultimately reject him, whether it be revealed in his word or revealed through his son, ultimately they will suffer the righteous, holy judgment of God and be cast forever in eternal pit called hell separated for the rest of all eternity as far as the east is from the west just as our sins can be removed so eternity rules many people today and there are some religions out there today that teach us hell that teach us that hell is simply a temporary abode and then when people are judged to hell it literally that word hell is translated from the word that means grave and it simply means that they die and they no longer exist the fact of the matter is is that when God created man he cre was created in God's image and God being an eternal spirit so mankind is too the belief in the annihilation theory or doctrine or theology concerning hell is straight from hell itself. God also reveals the kind of wrath considered eschatological wrath. That, that wrath will be revealed upon the final day, that great day of the Lord as it's called in the Bible. There will be many in that day which cry out to the Lord, have we not done this or have we not done that? To which they will hear these cursed words, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. There's such thing as cataclysmic wrath just a couple of examples of that the flood Sodom and Gomorrah an entire generation dying off in the wilderness there's consequential wrath which brings about the idea of sowing and reaping that which a man sows he shall also reap if you know something is eminently bad for you and you continue to do that you can expect eminently bad things to happen if you drive too fast you can expect to get a speeding ticket if you take uncertain risk you can expect one of these days, perhaps, that risk will come to fruition. And lastly, Dr. MacArthur lists 
God's abandonment, wrath. I want us to continue reading in Romans in chapter 1. Beginning, and I hope you underlined or highlighted, or at least you remember those words without excuse. In verse 21, Paul continues to write to the Roman church concerning the wrath of the, on the unrighteous. He says, because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart, foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like, into, made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their woman did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men, and we men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, and whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in that do them, in them that do them. We learn primarily in verses 19 through 21, we find the manifestation the manifestation, I apologize, I guess I've got these slides flipped. But. Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary says that this, the sense of this pregnant statement, the apostle proceeds to unfold in verse 20. And we find three different times, three different times, twice, God gave them up, once, God gave them over. Paul describes for us in these verses. Whoops, excuse me. I backed up. Let me back up. That those who have been condemned, those who have been judged righteously, God manifests himself through all of those things which he has created. You know what's so amazing is that when God created the heavens and the earth and the fowl of the air and the birds and the fish of the sea, all the four-footed beasts, He looked upon what he'd created. And we find two different examples in the Bible where God said, this is good. God said, this is very good. And we learn on the seventh day that God rested. That God rested. God created everything perfectly in its place. He created everything perfectly in order. There are those out there today, and I'm going to say something, and you may not agree with it, and it's perfectly okay for you to be wrong. There are those out there today that propose that man can make some kind of adjustment on the earth, and not only the earth, but the universe. 
Now, granted, we must be good stewards of what God has provided for us. But if you think, as an individual, that you can change the natural order of things in this world to which mankind today has grasped a hold of and has begun to accept as the natural, they've taken the, un, the unnatural and claimed it to be natural. And let me tell you something, folks. I'm not going to be politically correct. God created little boys and he created little girls. God created the universe perfectly in unison to work together. reading an article this week. I, I don't remember. You'll have to excuse me. I don't remember who wrote the article. That supposedly they have found the skeletal remains of the first male this is going to make some of you sick from two different species A little boy. And so now they are proclaiming that the natural order of things somewhere throughout history has taken two different species and has come together to create you. Not much different than the theory of Darwinism that was taught, that began to be taught in the schools back in the 60s and 70s. I remember when I was a kid, the circus didn't come through town very often. Some of you children in here perhaps have never even seen a circus. Circuses kind of went by the wayside years ago. But I remember as a kid growing up in southwest Arkansas, I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. I remember one particular time the circus came to town. Some of you may remember when the circus was the only gig in town. And I remember going to the circus. If my dad knew I'd wasted my money on the circus, he'd have killed me. And they had what they called these freak shows. Some have even come to light over the last several years. Where they had taken one animal and a part of another animal and they had combined them together. Not a live animal. But through artistic impression. To lead you to believe that these animals had crossed in their genetics. I remember when I was in school and studying biology. One of the things that amazed me the most was the duckbill platypus. Do y'all remember the duckbill platypus? Anybody remember the duckbill platypus? Kind of looked like a beaver with a duckbill. That was amazing. But today, people have come with, up with preposterous ideas. Not only is God revealed or manifests himself through the natural order of things to which man has twisted, but he's also pointed out for mankind that thing which is known as moral law. And in the first chapter of Romans, Paul points out that even though the Gentiles, if you continue reading on, even though the Gentiles did not have the law written down that God had given them a natural instinct to understand the difference between right and wrong. 
for instance, male and female were opposites, but were attracted to one another. Dr. David Jeremiah said that people reject God in seven ways. Through irreligion, ingratitude, intellectualism, ignorance, idolatry, immorality, and inversion. The third thing that I want to point out to you, not only does Paul point out for those in the Roman church the revelation and the manifestation of God to to all of the ungodly and unrighteousness, but also the abdication. I mentioned a little earlier that on three different occasions it says God also gave them up, God gave them up, and verse 28, God gave them over. And I want you to notice this, that the Bible uses a third person pronoun to describe the subjects of God's surrender. That word abdication simply means surrender. And if you were... In English class, you learned about pronouns, first person, second person, third person, an instance of a first person pronoun, both either possessive pronouns or uh, pronouns in general. The first person pronoun referred to I, me, and yes, even we. Second person pronouns were you, possessive pronoun was yours. Third person pronouns, such as God uses here in his word, who inspired Paul to write it, includes other words such as he, she, and them. If you look in two different places, it said God gave them up. In one place in verse 28, it says God gave them over. But if you look at the original Greek, it's the same. What it is in the original Greek, I'm not trying to impress you. you most of you know that I grew up in South Arkansas. I was uh, helping at a funeral here yesterday at the church, and this young lady had come uh, with the funeral home. She was a, I'd never met her before working with the funeral home, and she looks at me and she says, where are you from? She didn't say it in exactly those manners. I said, well, I grew up in South Arkansas. She says, well, that explains the draw. She said, I know I've got an accent. I said, well, I said, uh, you know, I've told the church here at, at Oak Grove Baptist Church that uh, they think it's a novelty to have a redneck preacher. But in the original Greek, the word, words are for all three of those verses, verse 24, verse 26, and verse 28. Paradidomai, autos, paradidomai. And that word parodidomai from the Greek literally means surrender. Surrender. Give up. Give them over. And so in essence, what it's saying here in the Greek is that God surrendered them surrender. God completely surrendered. He completely surrendered. Some of you may not like to hear this. But there have been times throughout the Scripture and throughout history and even today in which people are so hardened in their heart and sin sick in their morality that God surrenders them to their sin. Except they repent and turn to God for forgiveness and salvation. They cannot, nor will not, be saved. That is one of the reasons why when Jesus sent his disciples out and instructed them concerning the cities into which they were to go, 
for those cities that did not receive them nor their message to simply shake the dust off their feet as a testimony against them. You see, because ultimately they would commit the grievous, the most grievous of sins, the rejection of the gospel, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. We, my friend, would be in the same boat but by the grace of God. And our salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, but preacher. Oh, but preacher. I've got a brother or a sister or a cousin or a mo- father or a mother that is not saved. My friends, I'd encourage you to continue to share the gospel with them until Jesus takes you home. We find the reason of the Gentile guilt. It's because they refused or they had not either heard or refused the gospel. But let me reiterate these words. They were without excuse. When you do all you can do it becomes no longer your responsibility. But preacher, point them out. I can't do that because man looks on the outward appearance God judges the heart I would say keep on preaching and let God sort them out keep on teaching keep on sharing the Holman Science Bible commentary says in regards to these verses The refusal to acknowledge and glorify God results in a downward path, worthless thinking, moral insensitivity, and religious stupidity. My friend, if you're here this morning, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Except you repent, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Except you except the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ upon Calvary's cross, the shedding of his blood as sufficient, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Perhaps you're here this morning and God has spoken to your heart and he's called you to salvation through the sacrifice of his son. If you fail to respond to the message of the gospel, no amount of good works, no number of attendances, doesn't matter what membership you hold, you will be found guilty and judged and suffer the wrath of a righteous, holy God because you're without excuse. When Jesus comes back, he'll hear none of this. Well, Lord, we didn't know. 
Lord, we hadn't heard. Lord, we'd never seen. Because it's evident. It's here. And if you're a Christian, it's here. Where do you stand with the Lord Jesus Christ this morning? Do you know him? Does he know you? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Don't let it be said. In regards to God, that he perodidomai, autos, perodidomai, because you refused and you rejected. And that day has come when God just gives you over and gives you up to that lifestyle of sin. Let's stand together this morning as our music team comes. I want to give you an opportunity to respond in however God is leading you to do this morning, whether it be to receive salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ or simply come to the altar to pray, whether it's the confession of your sin right there in the, in the aisle where you're at or righting a wrong with a brother or sister in Christ. Will you do that today? Our Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for this day. Once again, for your grace, for your mercy, for salvation, for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as Christians, we know that we will not suffer the judgment or wrath of hell. But Lord, perhaps some have committed the sin of omission. Perhaps there are those here today that have, sit, have sinned in that they have committed. Lord, we pray that your will might be done, that they would repent. For those that are lost, that they might be saved. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.